Good morning. We're uh, we're going to take a few Sundays now. It's the Christmas season, and and uh, we're going to take the next few Sundays and cover the Advent. Um, I usually do things like this every other year, um, and then I do something different in the odd years. Uh, but Christmas is maybe one of the most complicated. Uh, most people don't know this because they they uh, all they've ever heard is the soundbite version of Christmas. Um, but uh, uh, there's an awful lot about Christmas that people have never been taught, especially Christians. Christians uh, think it's uh, the first mistake that we make is that it we assume that it's one day long. Christmas is one day long, and it's not. Christmas is uh, uh, Christmas is not a day. Um, we've got that all confused in the Christian church. Um, so uh, we're going to cover Christmas in detail. The ancient way to do this was called the Advent. Now, the Advent is, uh, the word actually means the arrival or the coming of. Uh, so when we refer to Advent in the context of Christmas, we're talking about the arrival of the Christ, the one that was promised all the way back to the book of Genesis um, when it was first promised. His name back then was Shiloh. That, that was the uh, uh, original Hebrew name given to the Christ. And uh, he's had different names down through the ages, uh, depending on language and context. Uh, Messiah, uh, Christ, uh, it generally always means the same thing. It's the Savior, the, the God-sent Savior of all men. And uh, so the coming of Shiloh uh, and Advent uh, is, is a period of seven, seven sermons. Uh, we think of a sermon as happening on Sunday morning, but there, there's actually uh, interspersed in the holidays, if you want to call it that, there are uh, six Sundays and then a Sabbath day, which is Christmas Eve. And uh, the Roman Catholic Church popularized the midnight uh, mass uh, on Christmas Eve. There was a reason that they chose midnight, but they got it wrong too. And there's uh, so Sunday or, or uh, the Sabbath day of Christmas is, uh, is the seventh. And so we're talking about a time that begins uh, a lot earlier than we start thinking about Christmas and ends a lot later than we think about Christmas. Uh, we're going to cover that in detail and what's involved. And today, um, I'm going to focus on the second, uh, the second uh, uh, sermon of Advent. Last time, we would have done the first. We didn't get together last time for different reasons. Yeah, it was Elizabeth's fault. She got sick and Nobody wanted to catch whatever she had, so uh, poop. We we decided to to uh, uh, skip it, and uh, we did. If you're interested, the Advent uh, pass, uh, pamphlet uh, for the first sermon of Advent is over there in a stack on the bureau, uh, so you can grab one of those on your way out if you're if you don't have one already. Um, so this is going to cover the second lamp, if you will, the second uh, um, menorah lamp of Advent. Yes, what? It's on the screen. Some people. Okay. Um, with that in mind, let's uh, let's uh, focus on these seven subjects. Uh, uh, each one is a different subject with a different context. The seven of them combined give us the entire celebration of Advent. Um, Christmas is a part of Advent. Um, you'll see that in just a minute. And uh, so, so today we're going to be talking about Happy Holidays. Now the reason that Happy Holidays is uh, one of the subjects is because I, I uh, uh, whenever I, I give a talk to groups, and I do that a lot during the Christmas season, I, I talk to, to groups a lot. Whenever I have the opportunity to talk about Jesus and talk about uh, Christianity, uh, one of the first things I'll do is uh, uh, get up in front and say, and say, Happy Holidays! And that's just to see what kind of a reaction I get. Um, a lot of other people uh, 
generally, if it's the first time I've spoken there, a lot of people will respond by saying, happy holidays. And um, quietly, of course, they don't get rambunctious until a little bit later. But um, then I proceed to tell them that, uh, okay, now, before we get started, uh, it's important for you to understand that, that that's a no-no. Don't say, don't even listen to anyone who says happy holidays. You're going to go into restaurants and shops and stores and malls where people will say to you, cashiers and waitresses and all kinds of people, will come up to you and say happy holidays. They've been taught to do this. What I want you to do is, is say back to them, look them right in the eye, and you say very loud, you say, Merry Christmas! And you look right at them when you're doing it with a stern look on your face. Merry Christmas! So let's try that. And, and I proceed to, and of course, you know what happens. I, I say, happy holidays. And you hear, Merry Christmas. You know. <laughs> and I have to goad them several times more before it gets loud enough that it satisfies everybody. And by that time, they're all worked up and, and about the whole thing. Um, yes? Christmas, I I will take the opportunity in this pamphlet as well as in, in the rest and this the slides, you'll notice that there's an apostrophe <laughs> added between Christ and everything else. So, uh, yeah, it is Christ. Uh, whether it is Christmas or the christening or uh, a variety of other things that we're going to touch on, um, uh, because this is a huge, huge subject. Oh, everyone looks at Bridget Jensen and they were required to say happy holidays. Yes. What she say? She said happy holidays. Happy holy days. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or, or better, yeah, happy, happy holiday, <laughs> singular. Yes, happy holiday. Don't well, we're going to we're going to talk about this concept today in detail. Uh, the recording that we just heard, the the song, uh, uh, it's it's capital C. This it's it's called Christmas, capital with a capital C. The problem with that song and and uh, and the uh, the background patter that he gave us, uh, and and it bothered me. I even had a waitress. Uh, uh, correct me when I said, uh, no, Merry Christmas to her. And she said, well, I'm not going to say Merry Christmas because there are hundreds of holidays during this period of time, and I don't want to offend anybody, so I'm going to say Happy Holidays. You can go ahead and say Merry Christmas if you want. It bothered me, and it bothered me in this song, too. As much as I like that song, the problem is that he doesn't correct anybody. He says, this is what I believe, this is why I say Merry Christmas. But he doesn't go ahead and, because the, the argument that everybody gives for saying Happy Holidays is there are hundreds, literally hundreds of holidays in the month of December. Well, and this song was as long as one of your sermons. Okay. Yeah. It probably wouldn't be as popular. One of your sermons, that's, that's, Merry Christmas, that's what it is. Yes, yes. And, and I appreciate that. But how do you respond to the waitress who says, there are hundreds of other holidays. I don't want it. And that's, that's what this is for. What I have done, what I've done is I've researched this extensively. And I've looked into the history books. I have uh, used Google quite a lot <laughs> in researching this. Uh, and this contains all of the holidays. And you might be surprised to discover that there are two. Two. Count them. One, two. There's two holidays, and one of them, I'm speaking now of Hanukkah, is usually over long before people start wishing you happy holidays. The holidays that we're talking about are specifically Christmas holidays, and there are lots of them, but they're all Christmas. 
And so we're going to go through that now. I, I want to lead you through that so that you had this exposure and you can feel comfortable correcting people who say there are hundreds. No, there are not. And this is what we're going to do. Okay, uh, let's start with panel number one on the back. You know, before we get into this, let me, let me do this. Uh, let me take you through a quick timeline of what actually happened 2,000 years ago. Um, and uh, that'll give us a background for this. This is called the Nativity Timeline, and uh, I've put this together. Uh, this is probably going to last a little bit longer than I had intended, so let me start right in. Uh, the first thing that you should know is that above this timeline uh, is the wise men. That's one story all by itself, isn't it? The wise men. Uh, below the, the line is the story of Joseph and Mary. Okay? So this is how it plays out. Uh, Nazareth is where our story begins. This is the Christmas story now. Nazareth is where this begins. And on March 25th, the little C in front of a date stands for circa. And what it means is this is approximate or about. So approximately March 25th, March 25th, springtime. The angel appears to Mary in Nazareth, and that's where the story begins. Gabriel and uh, says to her, you're going to become pregnant by the Holy Spirit, and the child is going to be a man-child. His name is to be Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And he, he goes on to say that this is going to be the Son of God. Um, she's stunned by this. And uh, you've heard this story before, so I'm not going to belabor it. Then she conceives almost immediately and immediately travels to, her, to visit her cousin Elizabeth. Now, you should know that cousin is a variable word. Um, cousin doesn't mean what you and I think of when we mean cousin. When the word cousin is used by the Jews, it can mean good friends, uh, neighbors, it can mean a wide variety of different things. So, and, but I don't want to get into that right now. Right now, what you need to know is that Mary travels to Elizabeth. Now, what you may not know is where Elizabeth lived. Elizabeth lived in the hills surrounding Bethlehem, very near to Jerusalem. And so, Mary is going to travel all the way south to Bethlehem, or very near Bethlehem. Uh, Jerusalem is the capital. It's the big deal. You've heard of Jerusalem before. Uh, Bethlehem is located seven miles south and a little bit west of Jerusalem. Seven miles. Um, and this is, this is rolling hills, but it's uh, we're not talking mountain paths here. So this is an easy trek. Uh, it can be managed to in, in uh, easily half a day. Uh, if you are walking, and in those days they considered a full day's journey through this kind of country as 20 miles. 20 miles is considered a full day's journey. So you can see that seven miles from Jerusalem to Bethlehem isn't that big a deal. Okay? Um, so Mary travels to, to visit Elizabeth. Now, the reason that she traveled was because it was traditional back then when you become pregnant to hide yourself from neighbors and friends and everyone. You went into seclusion so that nobody could see you getting fat. That's literally what it was all about. Nobody, nobody wanted to see a pregnant woman, and she didn't want to be seen, so she went into seclusion. Mary decided to go visit Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth was already three months pregnant when Mary arrived. But at the same time that Mary conceives and leaves to go visit Elizabeth, the wise men see a star, a new star in the sky. Probably on the same day. The star did not appear when Jesus was born. It appeared when Jesus was conceived. Nobody taught me that growing up in the church. So the star appears over, probably over Jerusalem, because that's where the star led the wise men, ultimately. And then we proceed with the story of Joseph and Mary. 
Matthew 2, 1 to 2, now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Notice that they didn't follow the star to Jerusalem. They saw the star. The star was in the west. They were in the east. You see how that works? Boy, we get that turned around. So they saw a star in the western sky, but they were in the east, is the, is the way that you read the, the passage. And uh, they've come west to find him and worship him. So they did that, but uh, in late June, now this is three months later, Three months later, after all of this happens, uh, Mary returns from Elizabeth. Now, Mary returns, and uh, uh, this is in June. Uh, this is She's three months pregnant. She comes back because Elizabeth delivers. She was, yes? She had a couple problems with timing. Elizabeth was only three months No, pregnant. I'm sorry. I, I misspoke. Elizabeth was six months pregnant when Mary arrived. So three months later, Elizabeth gives birth to who we will call John the Baptist. Uh, not the same one that, that penned the book of John, or 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Different Johns. John was a common name back then, just to, like it is now. So, so John the Baptist was born, and uh, uh, Mary immediately leaves and heads back to Nazareth. The problem that she's got is that nobody knows that she's pregnant, which is what she wanted. But the double problem she's got is that she's not married. She's not married. And she's worried about how people are going to react when they see her pregnant without a husband. She's, going to wor she's also worried because she's engaged to Joseph. And Joseph doesn't know about this yet either. Okay, um, next on the timeline is in early July, probably a week or two later, a week or two later after Mary gets back to Nazareth, an angel appears to Joseph, and it's the same angel, Gabriel. Uh, the same angel appears to Joseph and gives him the same information, and with the emphasis on, you shall call his name Jesus. Uh, they usually named their children after uh, relatives, uh, particularly dead relatives, uh, to keep that name going in the family. Um, uh, John, you'll remember, when John was born, uh, he his father had to be questioned with a tablet because he couldn't speak. Um, the uh, uh, the mother Elizabeth uh, said, "We're going to call his name John," and all the neighbors and family objected. There's nobody. Nobody in the whole family, as far back as we can think, nobody's ever been named John before. You're wrong. And so they proceeded to ask um, uh, <laughs> Zacharias. Yeah, <laughs> Zacharias. They questioned him. Of course, he couldn't speak, but he could hear, apparently. And so he wrote down his name is John uh, because the, the angel had appeared to him and said the same thing. John is going to be the name. That's what you name him. These names were chosen by God, not by mom and dad. It's an interesting thing. Yes? I imagine all the kids know that Mary was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Yes. You didn't mention that. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah I, I mentioned that. Oh, yeah. Wake up, Sharon. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, a couple of weeks after she gets back, um, by this time, Joseph ha has heard that she's pregnant. Uh, he's thinking about canceling the pregnancy and putting her away privately is the way that... I'm sorry? Canceling, Can canceling the, the engagement. Yeah, the, what? You can't do that? Anyway, um, early July is when the angel appears to Joseph, and Joseph is resigned to this now. He's got the same problem that Mary did, uh, he's embarrassed among all of the family and, and population of this little town, Nazareth. Um, in late November, now this is, this is uh, another uh, 
uh, a whole bunch of time, uh, late November now, Caesar's decree is given. Um, circa November 27. November 27. Now, circa, because we don't know for sure what the exact date is. But that's the way that we have seen it celebrated down through history. And I'm going to get to this momentarily, why, it, why 1127 is the big deal. Uh, Caesar gives his decree, says everybody has to report for census counting. Uh, the way they counted the census is you went back to, this, to the place that you were born, the town that you were born, and you paid a tax of one shekel. One shekel is a coin, a specific kind of coin. You pay a tax, and what they did then is after all of the taxes were collected, they counted the number of coins they have. And that coin gives them a fair understanding of how many families there are involved in this. So uh, uh, if you're an adult male, um, and that's the only one that they're concerned about counting, they weren't concerned about counting the females. Well, the reason for this is because the females weren't earning money, number one, and number two, they weren't available for, uh, for service in the army, uh, if, if necessary. Uh, that was uniquely uh, the guys, and so they were interested in counting the guys. Um, so... Uh, for census purposes, Caesar gave this decree. It came at a really bad time because uh, she was about to pop in uh, late November. Um, they, uh, uh, they didn't realize it, but that date, November 27th, is the beginning of the Advent. The Advent runs for 40 days, 40 days exactly. And it runs from November 27th through January 6th. That's how long the Advent runs. Now, Christmas is a different thing. Remember, Christmas is part of the Advent, not the whole thing. We'll get to that in just a second. December 16th through the 23rd, they traveled to Bethlehem. Now, they were going probably a little slower than most, but still, they had to keep up the pace. The reason that we believe this is because they were traveling via caravan. Uh, there were uh, thieves in the hills that would kill you for uh, whatever you had. And so you didn't travel alone along this long stretch of, high, of, of pathway through the land. Uh, they were traveling south from Nazareth all, Nazareth all the way to Bethlehem, which was Joseph's home city. So when he got there, uh, this is the way that that looks, they got to Bethlehem. And it took them a while because they were traveling with a caravan, and that's the preferred way that people traveled back then. They didn't go by themselves. They traveled in large groups so that thieves were less likely to attack and kill people and steal things. Um, if you travel in a large, well-protected group, then you're, you're pretty well safe from that kind of thing. So they traveled in a group, but of course a caravan will move much slower than a than a certain man, uh, for instance, could travel. So uh, they would travel on, on average, they'd probably make about uh, 10 to 12 miles a day in a caravan if they were really hustling along. Uh, they were driving ox and oxen and, and things like that in the caravan. There's no mention in the scriptures of Mary riding on a donkey. This is tradition. We've added it to the story. Uh, so we don't know that Mary was, was riding on a donkey. It would have been nice, but, well, <laughs> better than walking all of that distance. But whatever happened there, we don't want to add anything to Scripture, nor do we want to subtract anything from Scripture. That's an interesting tradition, because when a king was coming in peace, he would ride into town on a donkey, which is why Christ did it, but... Ascribing it to Mary might be off track. You're right on that. Yeah, and um, it only enhances the mythology that that has been added to uh, Mary by the Catholic Church in, in the same way. So they traveled to Bethlehem, and they probably arrived about the 23rd, the 23rd. Now, the reason that they didn't arrive on the 25th, we know, was because Jesus was not born the same day that they arrived in Bethlehem. The scripture makes this very clear. Uh, Luke 2, 4-7, And Joseph 
also went up to Galilee and unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Notice that it wasn't, they got there and pop, she, she delivered. Now, while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should deliver the child. Also notice that this is ne the child is never called Jesus. It's always in scripture, always called the child. There's a reason for that, and we'll get to that momentarily the child, uh, that she should be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son. Now, this is Christmas. Christmas starts at December 25, which is not called Christmas, by the way. December 25th refers to the nativity. Say it. The nativity. The nativity is the name for December 25th, the birth of Christ. Christmas is how long? No. 12. 12 days of Christmas, right? The 12 days of Christmas. So it's 12 days long. It's the last 12 days of the Advent. And uh, it starts on December 25th and concludes on January 6th. Uh, January 6th is... Uh, is uh, where it ends, during the process, we pass through January 1st, which became known as the christening. That's the day that Jesus received his name. Luke 2, 21, And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So they, were, they gave his him the name Jesus as they were instructed by the angel. But he's but thereafter, um, uh, although his name has been given on the eighth day of life, uh, January, January 1st is the christening, uh, the problem is that he's still referred to quite often as the child. Uh, it will be later that he's actually called in Scripture Jesus. Um, but that's a side issue. Uh, the fact is that January 1st was originally known as the christening. Now, you should know that this was the Roman Empire. The calendar was Roman. We get things like January, February, March, April, May, and all of the month names, as well as all of the day names, uh, Monday through Sunday. Now, all of these come from Rome, the Roman calendar, and uh, that's what we are still celebrating, the Roman calendar. Even though it's now the Gregorian calendar, we, it used to be called the Julian calendar after Julius Caesar. So anyway, this calendar that, I, that I'm talking about here is Roman. And the Roman New Year, the day that the Romans had picked for their New Year was March 1st. March 1st was New Year's Day for hundreds of years. It didn't change until the year 325 AD, after, after Christ, after he was born. 300 years after Christ, they changed it from March 1st to January 1st. For all that time, January 1st had been referred to as the christening. They moved New Year's Day, they being the church, New Year, started now on January 1st for a very, very important reason. They moved it to January 1st and then promptly forgot that it was the christening. Today, we celebrate January 1st as New Year's Day because the church moved it there. The problem is that nobody remembers that it was originally the christening, and that's the reason it's New Year's Day. January 1st is, January was not the first month in the year. Think about that. March was the first month in the year for hundreds of years before Jesus was born and after for 300 years. They moved it to January, which must have stunned a lot of people, but they moved it for an incredibly important reason, and we'll get to that. Lots of fun stuff here. So um, January 1st became New Year's Day, and... January 3rd 
the wise men arrive in Jerusalem, January 3rd, circa, about January 3rd. The wise men finally arrive. They've been traveling all of this time. And they're the yellow branch there. Notice that they're coming in a different route than Joseph and Mary had traveled because they're, they don't start their journey in Nazareth. And they arrive ultimately in Bethlehem on what we call Epiphany. The church referred to the day as Epiphany. Uh, January 6th, remember their days start at dusk. So this was what we would think of as the, 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 the evening of the 5th of January. They would think of as the beginning of the day, January 6th. So January 6th, the wise men arrive. And they arrive at Bethlehem and they... Uh, give gifts to the Christ child. Uh, he's in a manger because um, uh, there's no room for them in the inn. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, you're right. You're right. They, they go into the house. Um, Mark 2, 9 to 11. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they had seen when they were in the east went before them until it came and stood over where the young child was, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy, and when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. Now, it had been eight days, uh, 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 12 days, since he was born. Uh, now they were no longer in the stable or the manger or whatever. Uh, they were now in a house. A uh, room had opened up, and so they were in the inn now. They were, they were in the inn when the wise men showed up. The wise men didn't come on December 25th. They weren't there when the shepherds were there. They came in 12 days later, and their arrival was the end of what we think of as Christmas, the 12 days of Christmas. Uh, then the next thing that happens is called the flight the flight. On approximately January 9th, the Magi flee. They run. They get out of Dodge as quickly as they can. And apparently on the same day, or very close to it, Joseph and Mary take Christ, take Jesus, and they run in the opposite direction. So the, the wise men are going to run uh, first, they're going to run east and then north. Let me see if I've got that. Yeah. They're going to run east to get out of the land as quickly as possible. The pink area on the map is the dangerous area. They've got to get out of Herod's territory, out of his jurisdiction, if you will, as quickly as possible because uh, soldiers are being tasked and the angel appeared to Joseph and said, get out of here. Uh, the wise men flee and they head east to get out of Herod's jurisdiction as quickly as possible, and then north along the king's highway. Uh, this is a, a big road uh, that runs north and south on outside the land, on the other side of the Jordan River there. Um, meanwhile, Mary and Joseph head south into Egypt. Now, Egypt is, is uh, Egypt proper uh, is way over uh, uh, to the other side. Uh, uh, to the east, or I'm sorry, to the west of uh, where they traveled. What they're entering here is, is called the Negev Desert, and it's the wilderness that Moses walked through with the, with the uh, children of Israel for 40-odd 40, uh, 40 uh, years. And, and uh, uh, this Negev Desert south is now under the jurisdiction of Egypt. And so Egypt... Uh, property line starts right south, and it's only two days' journey. So in two days, they're out of Herod's jurisdiction, and they're in Egypt. Uh, babies are killed in Bethlehem by the soldiers that were sent in. Um, this, uh, uh, this happens in mid-January sometime. And then Herod mysteriously dies. Uh, according to secular history, Herod dies of gangrene. They don't know the original cause, but uh, his body rotted from the inside out. And so he was dead, and his uh, uh, successor was uh, uh, Archelaus. And Archelaus was uh, 
uh, even more wicked than Herod was, but he put on a good face. Nobody knew for sure that he was a bad guy. Uh, that, that wasn't apparent until later. Meanwhile, um, uh, they returned to Jerusalem again at the uh, bequest of the angel, said, uh, go back to Jerusalem. And a lot of people get confused at this point. They're concerned that, that uh, the angel came to Joseph and Mary in Egypt and said, return to Jer Jerusalem. And then immediately, almost immediately, they left Jerusalem and headed home to Nazareth. Why would the, the angel tell them to go to Nazareth or to Jerusalem, which was dangerous because of the this Archelaus guy? Uh, why why do that? Did we just wipe out the whole thing there? Wonder why that happened. Let's skip that. Um, anyway, they yeah I know I know we'll. Yeah, we'll get there. Okay. Um, the uh, the reason that they they left, everybody left, was because Archelaus had had decided to reveal to himself just how much he really hated the Jews, and that's why they left. But there was an important reason why Mary and Joseph had to be in Jerusalem, and had to be here at that moment in time on February second. February 2nd, Sharon, um, the uh, uh, 40 days of her purification was done according to the law, and Jesus was presented to the Jews. Now, the thing that uh, in the temple, she, uh, she took the baby to the temple, they paid the tax to redeem the child, and uh, he was officially presented to Israel. The thing that's important to us is that that the Christ child was introduced to the Gentiles before he was introduced to Israel. Isn't that interesting? So we got first crack at it. <laughs> okay, now leaving that behind, let's continue here. This is uh, the timeline of the 40 days of Advent, the way that it stacks up today. Um, let's see here. Okay, there we go. Christmas, December 25th to January 6th. Uh, these are the holidays now, and we're going to talk about them as we go through this, this process. Now, uh, let's start with panel number one on the back of your, your pamphlets. Let me read through this, follow along as I read, and then we'll get down and dirty into these happy holidays that everybody's always talking about. This time of the year, we hear happy holidays a lot. They tell us they would gladly wish us whichever holiday makes us happy, if they only knew. But since they don't know, they keep it generic. They assume that there are dozens of different holidays during this season, and it would be offensive to single out just one. But have you ever wondered exactly what contemporary international holidays actually occur during this season? Which holidays does Happy Holidays actually cover? The U.S. calendars commonly list only Christmas because it is the only federally recognized holiday in December. Did you know that? Our country's official calendar lists one holiday. It doesn't even list Hanukkah. One holiday in the month of December. Now that's your first clue that this whole happy holidays thing has a, has an, a different agenda than trying not to offend other people. There's only one holiday as far as the federal government is concerned, and that's Christmas, the birth of Jesus Christ. Firstly, you'll want to understand that Christmas is not a single day. December 25th is actually the Nativity and is only the first of the 12 days of Christmas, which includes January 1st's christening and ends with the Epiphany on January 6th. And before the 12 days is the Advent, the four weeks prior to the Nativity spent in preparation for the festival. This 40-day season, November 27th, to January 6th 
contains 16 holidays, 15 of which are not just Christian, but Christmas. They're all Christmas, except for one. Now, there are also a few fake holidays. Uh, think Talk Like a Pirate Day, okay? This is a fake holiday. These fake holidays were fabricated during the last century specifically as attempts to celebrate the joys of Christmas without acknowledging Christ. And a few more old, obsolete, defunct holidays, such as Saturnalia and Malk and uh, whatever the and Solus Invictus that are no longer celebrated by anyone nor included in any modern greeting wishing you or anyone else happiness because of them. You've never heard anybody in a restaurant or behind a cash register or any place, any place, say, Happy Solus Invictus. And there's a reason for that. Nobody celebrates that holiday anymore. So you don't have to say, Happy Solus Invictus. It's a defunct antique holiday. It no longer exists. So when it says, listen, if we wish everyone a happy Mother's Day because it's Mother's Day, not because they love their mothers. Right? You don't wish somebody a happy Father's Day because you know that they love their fathers. In a restaurant, nobody, no waitresses or cashiers or anybody else has any problem saying Happy Mother's Day. They don't check, they don't avoid saying that because they think maybe he hates his mother. So maybe I shouldn't say Happy Mother's Day. They say Happy Mother's Day because it's Mother's Day. It's not about whether you love or hate your mother. The day is Mother's Day. So when you say Happy Mother's Day, what you're doing is you're describing the day, not your mother, right? What you do on Happy Mother's Day or Mother's Day is up to you. But Happy Mother's Day is a reference to the day, not to your mother. As long as we understand that, the rest of this is going to make sense. In the same way, we say Merry Christmas because it's Christmas. And it has been worldwide for nearly 2,000 years. It should have nothing to do with what you believe or offending anyone about anything. When someone wishes you happy holidays, it's not because they worry about offending you. It's because they want to offend you. When somebody says happy holidays, they are trying to offend you. They are purposely removing Christ from the most important days in history. Furthermore, as this little booklet shows, the only real holidays at this season are Christmas and Hanukkah. And Hanukkah is often concluded well before they begin wishing us happy holidays. So there are not dozens of different holidays during this season. There's really only one, and it's called Christmas with a capital C. Okay, let's turn into the inside now. Panel number two. Hanukkah. Um, let me put that up on the screen here. Hanukkah. Okay, that's this year. Um, there are certain times that Hanukkah coincides with Christmas. That is, the 25th day of December is also the 25th day of Kislev, the lunar, the lunar month that Hanukkah is celebrated on, the 25th day of Kislev. How far off is it, is it this year? Uh, not too bad. I mean, we're, we're talking about uh, an overlap. I, yeah. Right down here, I, I'll give you the dates. Uh, the winter dedication... John 10, 22 of the Second Temple in Jerusalem at the time of the Maccabean revolt against the Seleucid Empire, B.C. 160. Now, you have to memorize that. Don't, don't forget that now. It's very important stuff. No, I'm kidding. 
Turn to, uh, in your Bibles, turn to John 10, 22. And you'll want to mark this in your Bibles, so get out your highlighter. John chapter 10. John 10. Twenty-two, And we're going to mark with, uh, first of all, with a brown highlighter for those of you who want to stick with the, the uh, traditional coloring here. Uh, brown in your scriptures, uh, whenever you highlight words or passages in brown, um, tends to indicate movement or some activity, physical movement or activity. In the case of John, um, it's Jesus generally moving from one place to another. And it's nice to be able to identify that visually uh, by looking for the brown highlights. So this is a mechanical kind of a movement that uh, the brown highlight is. So what you should do is highlight uh, verses 22 and 23 of John chapter 10 in brown. It, and it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Now this is uh, uh, Jesus at Hanukkah. It doesn't say that word here. Uh, instead, it talks about the winter dedication. The winter, the only thing that was dedicated in the winter time, is the new temple uh, when they when they won it back from the Seleucids, so uh, uh, the uh, the Greeks. And uh, this winter dedication is today called Hanukkah. Hanukkah. So in the margin, you might even want to write the word Hanukkah. Uh, that's uh, so that you'll know what this winter dedication really was. Jesus was walking inside the temple in Solomon's court, uh, and what follows then, uh, which is, uh, uh, he talks about uh, giving eternal life and uh, a wide variety of other things, um, but very specifically uh, in verse 28, and you might want to switch to green in verse 28, I give unto them eternal life. You can highlight that in green. I give unto them eternal life, verse 28. And then I've got a yellow box around, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand, and all of verse 29. My Father which gave them me, Yellow, the yellow box it starts with the word neither in verse 28. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. And then verse 30 is again highlighted in green. I and my Father are one. Now, for those of you who are highlighting on a completely different subject, it's interesting, uh, in, back up in verse 21, skip way back here to verse 21, um, it says, others said, these are not the words of him that hath a devil, uh, the, because Jesus was being accused of, of having a devil, and that's why he was doing what he was doing. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? Question mark. I have that highlighted in yellow. Can a devil opened the eyes of the blind. It was clear to the Jews of the time that no supernatural power resided in any entity except God the Father. God the Father. Any power that was demonstrated by supernatural power that was demonstrated by Satan or the demons or the devils or anybody else came from God not only with his permission, but with his power. A perfect example of this is Job chapters 1 and 2, uh, where uh, uh, Satan 
uh, is given power by God to inflict Job. And thereafter, after chapter 2, uh, God takes credit for doing what was done to Job uh, himself. Uh, he did it, um, and um, uh, I did it. I did it for my reasons. You don't need to know why I did it, is kind of the message of the rest of the, the book of Job. Um, Okay, so let's close our Bibles after you've finished marking. That's the last that we'll use of them. I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew that Jesus celebrated Hanukkah. Now, it's fascinating to me that we don't. It's fascinating to me that we don't celebrate Hanukkah. Um, of course, it's fascinating to me that the church refuses to celebrate Passover or Sukkot or any of the other feasts that God gave to his people. I'm not trying to become a Jew. I'm just saying that these aren't myths. This is what God gave them for his purposes. And he specifically gave it to them as a memorial and gave it to us as a prophecy. And he says so in the book of Colossians. So if he gave it to us, the church, as a prophecy... Maybe we should be doing something about that. Maybe we should be celebrating these things. But instead, we make up mythical alternatives to them. So instead of celebrating Passover, which is what Jesus was doing with his disciples in the upper room, we celebrate communion, which is man-made. There is no such thing as communion in Scripture. The word communion occurs four times in the New Testament. And in each case, the English word communion is being translated from the Greek word koinonia, which means fellowship. It's not a sacrament. In each case, it's referring to fellowship, not a sacrament of bread and wine. Uh, there's, we've got a pamphlet on, on the mythology behind uh, uh, communion. And it's one of the reasons why we don't celebrate communion. Instead, we celebrate Passover. As often, uh, the New Testament says, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, uh, you do show the Lord's death until he come again. Now, there's... There's a lot in that passage right there. But the important thing for my purposes here in this context is that as often as you do this is not as, as often as you want to do this. What it's referring to is the fact that this is an annual feast. And you only have to turn to the book of Matthew to read the fact that six times it says what they were there to do in the upper room is to celebrate Passover. Jesus did Passover in the upper room. He wasn't doing communion. He was doing Passover. And so everything that he did in the upper room was to celebrate and explain the prophecy of Passover, not communion. Communion is a way to become anti-Semitic, which is, which is prevalent in the church in the Middle Ages. Uh, anything Jewish was worse than pagan. Um, we got to get rid of that Jewish stuff. So we'll do exactly opposite of whatever the Jews do on any given subject. Hanukkah, the winter dedication of the second temple in Jerusalem at the time of the Maccabean revolt, revolt against the Seleucid Empire. Now that's as much as you want to know about Hanukkah. Uh, we could talk about Hanukkah all day long, but what I really wanted to get to was Hanukkah remembers the miracle of a single day's oil burning in the newly recovered temple menorah for eight days until new oil could be made. The oil that they were using was by recipe given to them in the Old Testament by God. It took eight days to refine this oil so that it would be burnable in the menorah. The menorah is that, that uh, seven-branched candlestick up there. Uh, it's also the one that you see at the bottom of the screen right here, the seven branches sticking up. Um, they uh, kept this burning 24-7 in the, in the tabernacle first and then in the temple of Solomon, uh, which was destroyed. And uh, uh, 
this, then the, the second temple was uh, 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 built um, in the time of Ezra and uh, uh, Nehemiah, and uh, that one was uh, taken over by the, uh, the Greeks, and so the Maccabees uh, won that back. Uh, the Maccabees, we don't know whether that's the family name or whether it's just a descriptor <laughs> that they decided on for themselves. The word Maccabee means hammer of God, hammer of God. And uh, so Maccabee is a, is a treasured name. Uh, and they are the ones that won back the temple and the menorah. And uh, they only had one day's worth of oil. Uh, they took, took it and poured it into the lamps and lit the menorah and rededicated the temple. Hanukkah, the rededication of the temple in wintertime. That's what this Hanukkah is all about. And they, they were concerned because it was going to take eight days to refine the oil to replace that one day worth of oil. But the next morning they came back in and it was still burning. And the next day they came back in and it was still burning. And it was a miracle. A miracle happened here. That's what the word Hanukkah means. And uh, so they, uh, they were uh, stunned that it lasted for eight days. It was probably flickering to go out when they rushed in with the new oil and filled the cups once again. Starting on the 25th day of Kislev, according to the lunar Hebrew calendar, our, our calendar is solar, the Jews have a lunar calendar, it may occur any time from late November to late December. It slides back and forth. So here I've got it superimposed over Christmas. But it could be as early as late November. So it slides between late November and late December. On, the, on our Gregorian calendar. Once in a while, it will actually sync with Christmas, that is, right to the day. Uh, for instance, in 1978, in 1997, in 2016, and again in 2027, and 2073, etc. These are the, the years that will actually sync Hanukkah with Christmas. The, the lunar calendar with the uh, solar calendar. For those who believe our God authored it, Hanukkah is the origin of many Christmas symbols and a prophecy of Christmas itself. Now there are, I'm, I'm not going to get into this, that's uh, coming in one of the other Advent pamphlets. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, the fact that Hanukkah uh, is uh, uh, the precursor of many of the Christmas symbols, including uh, the, the uh, uh, the tree, uh, Christmas tree, and the presents, and uh, uh, the octave, the octave, uh, they celebrate it for eight days. Um, what do we celebrate at Christmas time for eight days? You ever thought about that? What? Well, no, Christmas is 12 days long. What do we celebrate for eight days? Called by the church the octave, the same thing that the Jews call no, Hanukkah is a Jewish holiday, eight days long. What do we Christians have? Christmas vacation between Christmas. Well, Christmas vacation, yeah, no, no. It's the, it's the number of days between the nativity and the christening, right? Isn't that interesting? God built all of that step, step by step. Okay, the Christmas season. Now, these are the Christmas holidays. The Christmas season. Krampus nut. Uh, first of all, the, uh, the preface to the Christmas season. 27 November to 6 January, four Sundays preceding the 25 December and the two after, celebrates the 40 days of Christ's advent from Caesar's decree on 1127 to the arrival of the wise men January 6th memorializes the birth of Christ, Messiah, Shiloh, the only begotten Son of God, as a human child sent to live a sinless life and die a horrific death as God's atoning sacrifice for man's sinful and rebellious nature. The single most celebrated holiday by Christians and non-Christians alike worldwide through a host of individual celebrations, such as... December 6th, actually December 5th, 
slash sixth. The Feast of St. Nicholas is celebrated in parts of Europe on December 6th. Um, they didn't celebrate back then, uh, and uh, all the way back to Jesus' birth for that matter. They didn't celebrate birthdays. Birthdays were not a big deal. Nobody remembered birthdays. The day of St. Nicholas, for instance, was not the day that St. Nicholas was born. It's the day that St. Nicholas died, supposedly. So they celebrated death days, which is why Easter was important to the church. It was the day that Jesus died and came back to life again, was resurrected. The Feast of St. Nicholas is celebrated in parts of Europe on December 6th. In Alpine countries, St. Nicholas has a devilish companion named Krampus who punishes the bad children the night before, the eve of St. Nicholas's day. So if you're bad in Alpine countries of Europe, um, Krampus, which is, is this guy here, this devilish looking thing, um, he brings switches to beat the children with. It's a good idea, actually. <laughs> <laughs> December 6th, St. Nicholas's Day. Uh, international recognized uh, ambassador of Christmas. And St. Nicholas uh, was uh, an important guy in history to every nation in the world. Every country in the world has its own name given to St. Nicholas. What are you laughing at, honey? Huh? No, not Popo Gijo. That was Tim Allen, not, not, not Santa Claus. Uh, in, in England, he's not known as Santa Claus. He's known as Father Christmas. And across the channel in France, he's known as Père Noël. Uh, uh, he no, has a different name in every country of the world. And uh, in America, in America, uh, he got the name Santa Claus by a mispronunciation. Uh, the little Dutch children who uh, came in to, uh, uh, they, they were immigrants into the United States, couldn't, could not wrap their tongues around the name St. Nicholas. And when they tried to say it, it came out Sant Naklaus. Sant Naklaus. They couldn't say St. Nicholas. So it came out Sant Naklaus. And when you say that three times fast, you get Santa Claus, and that's where the name Santa Claus came from, is Santa Naclaus. Ta-da! And it's been, and it was in the New York Times front page. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I find it fascinating, even more fascinating than the name Santa Claus is the fact that, that the New York Times referred to him, it as America's nickname. That's where we get the term from. Nickname because it was Nicholas, Nicholas's name in America. So the term nickname comes from St. Nicholas's mispronunciation by the Dutch children of St. Nicholas. And uh, uh, the New York Times made it official with our front page header. Uh, the nickname of St. Nicholas in America is now uh, Santa Claus, and that's where it came from. And, we, and it's been St. Uh, Nicholas ever since. In Mexico and in Canada, it's also among English speakers, it's also referred to as, Saint, as Santa Claus, uh, simply because it originated in America and they're close to the borders. But elsewhere in, in the world, Santa Claus is an unknown name. They don't recognize nor do they know that name. It's, uh, uh, it's a foreign kind of a thing. Uh, St. Lucia's Day, um, December 13. Uh, St. Lucia... Uh, is, uh, and this is a picture of uh, St. Lucia, uh, third century martyr, uh, St. Lucia, uh, who brought food to aid Christians hiding in the catacombs. These are the catacombs here. Uh, during the great Christian Holocaust, A.D. 35 to 325, it begins the Christian season in Scandinavia. So this is the beginning of their Christmas season, uh, uh, St. Lucia's day. Uh, St. Lucia was a woman who smuggled food into the catacombs. The catacombs was their graveyard. They buried people underground. They had tunnels that they dug into the rock down underground, and they put these, what they called them niches, these holes in the walls. That's where they laid the bodies, in those holes. And uh, they rotted there in those niches. 
Um, they didn't have burials. They didn't bury people under the ground. They didn't put them in coffins quite often. They just laid them in these niches. And uh, when, when they kind of uh, decayed away and all that were left were bones, they'd push the bones to the back and they'd lay somebody else, usually, usually of the same family, they'd lay them there too so that all of their bones were interred together. They had a tradition that they would come back about a year later once the, it was just bones left. Then they would wipe them down, organize them, and then use that for the next person, right? Well, they'd actually push the bones to the back. They wouldn't, they wouldn't clean the bones. They'd just push them to the back. This was a, a tough time. Those 300 years uh, of the hot Christian Holocaust, uh, they didn't have any of the niceties. They were under attack by the Roman government, and anybody that was caught uh, who was a Christian uh, was uh, sentenced to death and torture. Uh, so it wasn't just death. I mean, you were going to be tortured for weeks uh, until they uh, they finally decided to, how they were going to kill you, how they were going to murder you. Uh, it was a tough time. For 300 years, uh, 8 million men, women, and children uh, refused to recant the name of Jesus. And nobody went on record as recanting the name of Jesus to get out of the torture and, and the murder. So it was a it was a hard time, a difficult time, and uh, they couldn't they couldn't afford the niceties, and they hid in the graveyards, the, these tunnels down underneath the city, the catacombs. And uh, Saint Lucia was a uh, 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 woman that uh, uh, smuggled food down to them, and uh, see because of that, she uh, has a day named after her. She was martyred ultimately. And her death day became St. Lucia's Day, and they celebrate that as the beginning of their Christmas season in Scandinavia. Las Posadas, uh, December 16th through the 24th. Now, recognizing that the 24th leads them right into the Christmas season. December 16th through the 24th, the processions uh, to various family lodgings for celebration and prayer uh, to reenact Je Mary and Joseph's journey to Bethlehem. Now, this is kind of an interesting thing. Um, think of this as a progressive dinner. Have you ever been to a progressive dinner before? This is where we got the idea for progressive dinner. Las Posadas is a, a group of people who go to the first place, and they have, they have a little party there. And after they've had this little party and their snacks and stuff like that, then they pack it up and move on. Now, this is a, a picture. You can see it in the background. This is Mary riding a, uh, a horse in this case, I think, or maybe that is a donkey. And, uh, and uh, Juan, who is Joseph, uh, leading the, the donkey uh, from house to house. And the crowd grows with each house that they visit. Uh, you wouldn't want to be the host of the last house, by the way. <laughs> so uh, this Las Posadas happens night after night after night with the crowd growing bigger and bigger and bigger as they move from from uh, place to place until they finally, on the 25th, arrive at their destination, which is the beginning of the Christmas season. On December 21st, uh, they uh, have a a Christian holiday, part of Christmas, called the Longest Night. Now, the reason that they call it the Longest Night is because it's the longest night. It's the longest night of the year. So they were real clever with their name here. It's the longest night. Uh, they chose the longest night of the year for a church service or church services for those coping with loss of loved ones during the, the uh, previous year. And it's held on the evening of the winter solstice, which is 1221. Now, don't let anybody tell you that December 25th is the winter solstice, uh, which is Solus Invictus, by the way. Uh, they celebrated, uh, uh, a lot of people celebrated uh, before they had calendars, they celebrated the winter solstice. And uh, people who don't know any better are convinced that that's where we got Christmas from, is those ancient pagan celebrations of the longest day and the longest night. The problem with that is that that happens on the 21st of December, not on the 25th. Christmas Eve, December 24th, uh, the evening night that Jesus was born, thus the beginning of the Christmas nativity. Though celebrated today on the 24th, the original day began at dusk and ran through the day, night through the day. So Christmas Eve, was actually the evening of Christmas. 
the night of Christmas, celebrated before the day rather than after it. Christmas, December 25th through January 6th, the world's most celebrated holiday by Christians and non-Christians alike. The traditional observance ran 12 days from the Nativity, December 25th, through the christening, January 1st, the naming of Jesus, and concluding with the Eve of Epiphany, January 6th, the arrival of the wise men, and the introduction of the Christ child to the Gentiles. During the last century, our modern soundbite culture has collapsed this original 12-day celebration and all of the events into a single Christmas Day. Christmas Day is a new concept. If you had gone, if you had gone back uh, a thousand years and said Christmas Day to somebody, they would have no idea what you're talking about because Christmas didn't last for a day, it lasted for 12 days. So Christmas Day would be unknown to them. If you said the, the Nativity, they'd know what you were talking about. The Feast of St. Stephen, Boxing Day. Now this is the day after what you and I think of as Christmas, December 25th. On December 26th, the day after the Nativity, in England, this day was given to landholders gifting old clothes to their servants usually making way for the new clothes gifted to the landholders the previous day. So, so generous. <laughs> yeah, so they got new clothes, they got new stuff, and their old stuff was old stuff, so instead of giving it to the goodwill, they gave it to their servants, and this is the, in boxes, of course, uh, which is uh, why they call it Boxing Day, but it, it was St. Stephen's death day. This is the day that uh, St. Stephen, uh, my namesake, and Steve's too, uh, this was the day that he was stoned to death uh, in, in the book of Acts. So they call it the Feast of St. Stephen or Boxing Day. But it's part of the Christmas holidays. Keep in mind, all of these days are Christmas. The christening, January 1st. Now the christening occurs here. Um, let's see, i got to catch up here. The Longest Night, and uh, Nativity, the Feast of St. Stephen, Boxing Day, December 26th. And now we're up to the christening. This is also referred to in some places as St. Basil's Day. And we'll get to that in just a second. January 1st, though more recent, secular sources celebrated as New Year's Day. The original observance of the naming of Jesus on the eighth day of his life was celebrated as the christening on what would only later become known as the New Year. Before A.D. 350, Roman calendars designated March 1st as the new year. All of human history, now think about this, all of human history is divided into whatever happened before, that is B.C., and after, that is A.D., this day in history, January 1st, 0, the day that Jesus was born. Uh, named, I'm sorry, not born, but named. Remember, the birthday wasn't celebrated back at that time, but the day that his name was given to him, the christening, was the big deal among the Jews. So when they gave him his name on January 1st, on the eighth day of his life, that became known as the christening. The reason that the church in AD 3, 350 moved their New Year to that day was not because it was a better New Year's Day than the one that they had before. It was because that day became the dividing day of all of human history, and it remains that way today. If you say uh, somebody lived in A.D. 1635 or B.C. 520 or whatever, what you're referring to is 520 days, uh, years before this day, or 1635 years after this day in history. It's the dividing line in all of history, the day that Jesus received the name. The name above all names, the name at which every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. So it's a big deal, a big deal. St. Basil's Day, January 1st also. In Greece, he is the traditional Father Christmas, St. Nicholas figure. So St. Basil would be the name in, in Greek literature. Uh, that would be uh, Santa Claus's name instead of Santa Claus. It would be St. Nicholas's name 
uh, in Greek cultures, St. Basil, St. Basil's Day. The Twelfth Night, Epiphany Eve. They called it the Twelfth Night because it was the, the twelfth night of, of Jesus' life. That was when that happened. You and I would think of this as the night of the 5th of January, but because their night began their day, this would have been the 6th of January. And so um, uh, on uh, January 6th, Epiphany occurs. Uh, they arrived the night before. Uh, they, Christ is presented to the uh, Gentiles prior to the Jews, see below, and uh, their worship of him. Uh, the conclusion of Christmas as well as the Advent. Candle Mass. Now, this is a big deal. Candle Mass is important to the Jews, and it should be to us too. Candle Mass is February 2nd. We don't celebrate this in the church. We probably should. It's the purification of Mary and the redemption of the child and his presentation to the Jews. This is an important day because of the Jewishness of what's going on, uh, his uh, redemption uh, with two turtle doves in this case. Uh, now, this is the fun part. These are Christmas alternatives. There are seven of them all together that are currently in vogue. Uh, they are all brand new celebrations. They are man-made. These are fake holidays that have been made in the last uh, century uh, by people who want to celebrate Christmas, but they don't want to celebrate Christ. So they've come up with their own holidays. Um, these are obscure modern observances fabricated during the last century by pagans, atheists, and cults, often with political, religious, or ethnic agendas. The often observed by fewer than 5,000 folks worldwide who wish to celebrate as Christians do without acknowledging Christ or his birth. Body Day, celebrated worldwide in May. Now, this is important. It's celebrated worldwide in May, but in America, they changed the date. Uh, it's celebrated worldwide in May as part of Vesaka Day, memorializing or commemorating the day the historical Buddha experienced enlightenment. Uh, the word for that in, in uh, Japanese is body, so uh, that's why they call it body day. Eighty years ago, many Japanese adherents moved it to uh, the 8th of December in order to make it a more Western observance, which is a covert way of saying uh, as an alternative to Christmas. Pancha Ganapti, uh, December 21st to 25th, a five-day American-only festival invented in 1985 for Lord Ganesha, the elephant-headed chief deity of the Hindus, to give them something to celebrate besides Christ. This is a fake holiday. They don't celebrate this in India. They only celebrate this in America because in America they celebrate Christmas. Soyel, December 21st, the winter solstice ceremony of the Zuni and Hopi Indians, celebrated by fewer than 5,000 souls inhabiting a 2,500 square mile reservation in the southwest USA. Uh, this, is, this was not created way back when they were roaming the plains and, and uh, cowboys in Indian days. This is all within the last uh, 70 or 80 years that they decided they needed a December 21st celebration, so they'd come up with something. Navajo actually has uh, the Ten Commandments inscribed in rocks. That I can are see that. <laughs> so you wonder if this paganism has something to do with uh, had, the had its roots Asian in. Connection. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. December 23rd, and this is where it gets fun. I, I enjoy this. Uh, this is hilarious. Human light. Human light. December 23rd. Uh, humanist holiday. Humanists believe that, uh, 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 pretty much whatever you want to believe. <laughs> humanist holiday originated by the New Jersey Humanist Network in celebration of a humanist's view of a good future. So their, their idea of a good future is different than Christmas. So they had to come up with their own holiday to celebrate at Christmas, and they call it human light. 
Then there's Newton mass, which I find hilarious. This, they got this all messed up. But atheists came up with Newton mass. Uh, intelligent, uh, uh, scientific kinds of uh, types of atheists. To cel celebrate it on December 25th, a small number of atheists created Isaac Newton's birthday on December 25th as Newton mass. They insist that instead of... Uh, Instead of the reason for the season, which is Jesus, uh, at Christmas, they celebrate the season of reason. This is ironic because Newton was born on January 4th and reasoned as an avowed Christian. Oops. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're supposed. They're supposed. Uh, they're supposed uh, intellectual. Uh, Kwanzaa, and we've all heard, oh, no, I skipped one. Quad, Quad Azam's birthday, December 25th, invented in 1998 as a Muslim alternative to Christmas, celebrates Muhammad al Jinnah, uh, born in 1876, the founder of the Muslim Pakistan, as the one who altered the course of history. Uh, that's pretty magnificent terminology for somebody that none of us have ever heard of. <laughs> Kwanzaa. December 26th through the January 1st. Uh, it's interesting that that's the same uh, octave that the, the church celebrates between uh, Jesus' birth and his christening. Invented in 1966 by black nationalists, militant political, to give, and this is their statement, not mine, to give blacks an alternative to the existing holiday and give blacks the opportunity to celebrate themselves and their history rather than simply imitate the practice of the dominant society. Notice that they don't celebrate, they don't mention Christ, they don't mention Christmas, they don't mention whites, uh, but it's clear that they are, what they're doing with Kwanzaa is specifically so that they don't have to celebrate Christmas. And that brings to a close the entire group of contemporary holidays that are celebrated during this month of December, during this Christmas season. There is only one true holiday. Did I say that? And I, I didn't come to any conclusion there, did I? That's too bad. Um, there are not dozens of different holidays. There are two, Hanukkah and Christmas. The Christmas season incorporates a number of holidays, but they're all part of Christmas. So when somebody says happy holidays, you and I know that what they're really saying, even though they don't understand it, is they're referring to Christmas. If you pointed that out to them, they would be offended. They would be offended. This isn't about trying to keep from offending you. This is about working really hard to get Christ out of Christmas. And that's all that it's about. Take this and uh, uh, feel free. There are extras someplace. Did we use them all? Okay, they got one left. <laughs> I'll get more if you're interested. But next time somebody gives you happy holidays and you respond by saying, Merry Christmas, loud, and they respond by saying no or saying happy holidays because we don't want to offend anybody, what you do is hand them this and walk away. So at least during the next month, carry one of these around with you just so that you have it ready. It's like, like drawing a gun in the old restaurant. <laughs> okay. Um, the, uh, uh, the fake holidays here are uh, December 8th, the Japanese body, uh, the December 21st to 25th, uh, Pancha Ganapti, uh, and uh, December 21st, Soil, and then uh, December 23rd, Human Light, and then good old Newton Mass, as well as Quaid i Azam on December 25th, and Kwanzaa. Um, altogether, these represent the fake holidays that have been added to the holiday calendar by men not recognized by the federal government, but in the last century in obvious attempts to give them an alternative to Christmas. 
Um, there are no real holidays except Christmas and Hanukkah. And Hanukkah isn't even acknowledged by the federal government. So, there is only one holiday. If you did nothing more than to point out to the people who say happy holidays, uh, you could say something as simple as, you know, according to the federal government, there is only one holiday. And it's called Christmas with a capital C. <laughs> yeah. And then you, then you can start dancing around like Sharon does. Yeah. Okay. Um, with that, let's, uh, let's close in prayer and uh, uh, we'll... Uh, uh, will uh, go out into the world and correct the mistakes that have been made. Let's pray. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your